And of course, after doing this for all these years, I still forgot to bring my list of questions up here. So sorry about that little detour. So um, we're going to have a conversation format event tonight. Those of you who are regulars know that sometimes we have a single person do a presentation. Sometimes it's a panel. This is a good topic for a conversation. We encourage you to be part of it by submitting questions in the Slack channel as the event goes on, as I said. I also want to encourage you to do one other thing. Make sure your phone, if you've ever used a Gen AI tool, make sure you can log into that Gen AI tool from this event. We'll explain why in just a moment. All right, so thank you guys for joining us. Are you, let's check your mics, make sure they're all hot. Pleasure to have you, check. Jerry. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. All right, why don't we just do a real quick 15 seconds about each of you uh, for our audience before we get right into the questions. Sure, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Robert Matney. I work for Primer AI. We're an AI ML company primarily focused on national security and national defense use cases. We leverage um, uh, generative AI to power a few of our feature sets. Um, my original interest in this space is around disinformation and detecting state uh, controlled propaganda networks. And now my interest overall is AI ML and uh, some components of generative AI. Hi, I'm Nima Damani. I work at Kung Fu AI. We are an AI ML consultancy startup and we are currently doing a lot of Gen AI work. We have previously done a lot of disinformation work. I have been in the disinformation space for several years now, um, doing some state actor work similar to Rob. I've worked with and at platforms. I've worked at a nonprofit um, where we were working on demonetizing disinformation. So I've seen um, this problem at a couple different angles now. Thanks for having me. My name is Ryan Williams. I'm a uh, the deputy director of the Global Disinformation Lab at UT. I'm a PhD student at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, um, and I had a project called the Global Disinformation uh, Policy Database, where we're actually trying to compare um, and encode all the legislation and policy around the world about uh, these issues, misinformation and disinformation. I had the pleasure of working with these amazing folks um, doing a variety of computational disinformation um, uh, and propaganda research. Uh, and I think this is one of the most important issues facing um, our society at this time. So I'm really thrilled to be here speaking about it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. It's one of the reasons we scheduled this, uh, especially we've had a lot of AI topics recently, but the role of Gen AI in misinformation, as we're going to talk about tonight, makes this topic even more important. And the Austin Forum has picked misinformation and disinformation as a recurring theme. We will still always cover all emerging and persistent technologies. But it turns out that a lot of challenges that society faces are due to confidence in the information people get about those, those issues. And misinformation, of course, contributes to that. So that's why this topic is so important to us. So thank you all for coming. And we're going to start with definitions. So let's define misinformation first. Who wants to take that one? All right, Robert. Uh, misinformation is typically defined as information that is deemed to be factually inaccurate and either share, share, propagated without any apparent malignant or malicious intent. How about uh, disinformation? I'll take that one. So disinformation is information that is false or misleading and is shared with an intent to harm. I do want to quickly talk about the information disorder because I think that disinformation, misinformation, malinformation are, I think, really useful terms to understand the information landscape. But I do want to point out that it is very nuanced when it comes to solutions and mitigations to use a lot of these terms. So I generally like to think of it a little bit more holistically in terms of adversarial narratives um, and just an adversarial narrative that um, carries a risk of harm as opposed to narrowly thinking about the problem as content that is true or false. Right. And how about malinformation, Ryan? How did I get stuck with malinformation? By the way, how many of you have heard the term malinformation before tonight? It's only a small number. Okay, I learned we'll... it from Robert, actually, in a podcast we did a few months ago. Um, so I'm not surprised not a lot of people have heard of it, but Ryan, educate us on Let me know term. how I do with, with getting the point across. I think, so when I think about malinformation, I go back to uh, Claire Wardell's um, information disorder framework that actually split this concept up uh, along these lines. Um, and she defined malinformation as information that's shared with the intent to harm that may or may not be false. Um, and that usually is shared um, out of context 
or is private information that was um, shared through means such as hack and leak operations from state disinformation actors and, and those type of uh, information behaviors. Um, let's talk about some other terms we've all heard of, and you can you can tell us, is it misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation? The fun one, marketing. Yes. It, it, is it really ever more than misinformation? Is it ever actively disinformation or malinformation? Just marketing. I mean, we hope it's all true, but occasionally brands will say we're the absolute best with no quantitative measure of backing that up. So is it that they err when they err, they err on just, just misinformation, right? Not disinformation or... Oh, I think it's easy to imagine examples of marketing that are any of the three. I think primarily it's misinformation, mi misrepresentations, um, you know, falsity in advertising. I think that's the most typical. But um, if, if you give me a second, I can imagine uh, some I can ask you to do some disinfo or some malinfo that would drive marketing campaigns as well. If I could, I could jump in there. I think that this goes back to the kind of one of the issues with defining these concepts, especially operationalizing them for the purpose of either platform policy or um, legislation or government policies, is that you have to define them in consistent ways that work across jurisdictions. And for example, Europe, in Europe, um, they do define disinformation, several states and even at the EU level, uh, with reference to um, a motivation to make money. Um, so at that point, it's kind of like, how do you disaggregate false advertising from what in EU at least right now is, is considered disinformation? So because there's an intent to make money, they're, they're actively and intentionally doing it, so it falls under disinformation. Uh, according to the, the way that they operationalize that concept. And I would just add that it's worth noting that that all of these terms are an attempt to influence and persuade people of a way of thinking that may result in them buying into a product or buying into an idea. So the, dis, the disaggregation of um, influence operations and marketing, it's a false binary. It's a continuum uh, and, and therefore is part of the nuance of the landscape. So I picked an easy example, at least I thought was one there, and you you reminded me it could be all of the above. Conspiracy theories, and let's pick one like UFO, you know, that there are aliens walking among us or something. UAPs. Oh, sorry. Unidentified aerial phenomena now, right? UAPs. So would that be – actually, UAPs wouldn't be the conspiracy theory. The belief that some people, a la Marvel Secret Invasion among us or aliens or something, would that be – misinformation because they believe what they're saying it's just false or would it be disinformation or is there an example of something like that that's malinformation i'll take a swing unless you want to i think primarily miss with the flavor of dis if the intent uh, of dis is to red pill people into a worldview that brings them into accordance with other conspiracy theories, then that's an attempt to persuade with false information done with malignant intent. But I think that that's probably dis disproportionately small, probably. And um, another aspect is when you are, when your role in an organization like at a platform or something, is categorizing these phenomenon, a lot of the times you can't afford to think in terms of discrete pieces of content, right? So um, if, if you go to the platforms or if you are trying to design legislation, the last thing you really wanna do is be thinking about what, is this tweet disinformation or misinformation? Is this tweet about uh, the UAP's disinformation or misinformation? A lot of it has to do with the behavior that produced that content, how it exists in the larger context of the platform that it's engaging on and, and what its intent was uh, by the person sharing it and the person creating it. Intent drives at it. The question is, do you trust the government to tell you the truth or is the government lying to you? And, and if the purpose is to persuade people that the government is lying to you, then you have to ask the question, who in whose benefit is it to persuade you that the government is lying to you? Which is why the why matters so much so often. And the last example one, maybe this is a clear cut one, propaganda. Almost always disinformation. Usually, well, although I will say, um, you know, especially for coming from state actors, uh, uh, 
many state actors we've seen are not shy about taking real information, sprinkling in false information or doctored information and releasing uh, information that they shouldn't have had access to in the first place in order to shape narratives and influence folks. All right, so thank you for those definitions and then for applying those terms to uh, some common things that we've heard about. Is it fair to say, I mean, I picked these examples for a reason, uh, marketing and, and propaganda and conspiracy theories, these have all been around with us forever, right? Since two humans could communicate and one of them wanted to convince the other of something. So these are not new things. But what is new is the tools for creating and distributing this content, right? So could each of you just give us a little bit of your flavor for the current landscape and why these are such hot topics now in the context of the recent technologies like smartphones and social media and such. So Ryan, why don't we start with you and talk about how these now popular technologies have really facilitated the spread of mis, dis, and malinformation? Well, I think you're right in pointing out the um, tension between what is obvious that people lie to each other, people dissemble, people try to mislead each other, and they have been doing so throughout our history. Um, the tension between that fact and what is obviously new, which is we are all um, carrying sensors around with us that capture information. We are all constantly getting information from um, networks of people we know, networks of people we don't, and that these networks have specific affordances that allow us to find each other in ways that were not possible, right? So, I mean, um, one of the most vibrant Reddit communities that I, I like to dip into from time to time is about these the UFOs. And they have amazing moderators, they have um, fantastic culture, and these people have found each other and who knows if they would have had the same ability to find each other. And I, I use that example so as not to have to resort to more fringe or more harmful communities. But you can imagine that that dynamic takes place um, along the same uh, spectrum. Um, and so these platforms enable us to find each other in new ways. They allow us to um, unlock uh, performative information sharing behaviors that previously were just not possible. And uh, I think it, um, you know, there are academics who believe that it should be a crisis discipline, the study of collective human behavior, because previously it has not been a, a subject that you could actually look at. You could measure collective human communication. It's a completely new paradigm. And so there is that tension between, yes, it's always been here, but also the tools that we have uh, access to are completely unlike anything we've seen before. Want to add to it? Yeah. I think Ryan makes a really good point about social and participatory media. And I think that's why we've been seeing a lot more of these narratives lately. Um, I think a lot of disinformation is driven by socio-psychological factors, right? A lot of people want to um, find or define their identity online. And a lot of it is ideologically driven. So a lot of people, whether it is, I don't know, like parents who are um, supporting and who are not supporting vaccines for their children, maybe it is um, activism for climate change, um, whether it is like government or religious groups, a lot of it is people trying to find their little niche online. And you can see how a lot of that could get really complicated really, really quickly. Uh, other than speed and reach, which Ryan articulated well, and niche communities, I would say, uh, I would just add to your observation, Numa, about niche communities, the ability to not only join and form a niche community, but the uh, trivial capacity to target niche communities is maybe the third element for me. Yeah, and I would add to that the ability to get data on all of the above, which facilitates the targeting that you just mentioned and so the analytics behind that. Um, we talked about mis, dis, and malinformation and that they're all false and in some cases have an intent and in some cases a very negative intent. What we didn't talk about yet, and we're going to set the stage with one more question before we really dive into the technologies, is what is the current U.S. policy on this? I mean, I could tell you all that my hair is blue and there's nothing illegal about that. It's not true. But what are the current policies in place and laws in place in the U.S. We'll focus on that here, and then I'll, I'll come back and ask you about EU and, and such. But um, a lot of people think X is wrong or Y is illegal or Z can't be done, but really, we don't have a whole lot of legal framework here, do we? 
No, we don't. And I think it, it's interesting because you see efforts to, um, you know, not even legislate the problem, but create organizations um, inside federal agencies or create even teams that work on this issue. Um, and they have to be very careful because in this country, we have extremely strong um, free expression uh, guarantees in our constitution and also uh, in section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Yeah, um, uh, essentially, uh, creates a barrier around platforms where they are not liable for the content generated by their users, which gets very interesting when you consider, you know, our generative AI uh, actors users. Um, uh, but, you know, these kind of dual pillars of, of our system of online speech and, and the governance of online speech uh, really complicate policy um, responses to these issues. Um, and, you know, add to that the fact that it is incredibly easy to characterize even the best intentioned activities in this space as pure partisan power grabbing. Um, and, and it's understandable, right? Because we have this natural reaction, this revulsion to someone saying, uh, you know, we want to understand why someone's saying something online, because it's one step away from saying you can't say that online. And we, again, we have very strong free speech protections in this country. But, um, you know, you, you don't need to look any further than the Department of Homeland Security's uh, Disinformation Governance Board, um, which was itself the target of some pretty um, uh, interesting narratives, uh, some of which were really off base, um, and some of which were fair criticism. Um, and so it, you know, if I'm a policymaker in the United States, I'm facing one of the most complex environments um, for solving a, a really vital issue that I can imagine. I, I would add that um, in addition to our, our expansive but not unlimited First Amendment rights and uh, 230 implications uh, around platforms, I would add that there are authorities that uh, conscribe the uh, ability for the government to surveil, uh, except under very particular criteria, um, and, and the and then otherwise, all you can do is say it's heterogeneous and it often disagrees with itself. Is the rest of the landscape? Uh, it, there's not a unified front on this at all, and I'll just note that that um, uh, puts. In, in the fight for being the nation that lives the values that we uh, believe in or profess to believe in, that puts us at an asymmetric disadvantage to uh, adversarial nations who may not have those constraints, indeed, who, who very often do not have those constraints and certainly can pull things in a homogeneous structure um, that is very adversarial. I think both of you made such good points that I don't have too much to add except because of all the reasons that Rob and Ryan mentioned, um, disinformation, which should not be solely a platform problem, really now the prop it does lie on platforms to solve this problem. Um, platforms have spent like years struggling with how to maximize free speech while trying to get rid of the worst of the internet, um, which you know, it's a hard problem. Yeah, I want to make sure I summarize this before we move into our discussion of some of the technology. So um, in the US, we have the First Amendment, which protects certain things, it's not nearly all the things that people sometimes claim, oh, it's my First Amendment rights. It's actually a pretty short amendment, and everybody should read that, and it gives you some ability to understand why some misinformation and disinformation happens all the time, and nothing legal happens about it, and that absolutely free to express that. Um, Section 230, for those of you who may not be aware, you guys fill me in if I get this wrong, but it, it gives some protection to these social networks for the accuracy of content posted on them by other people. And it was originally intended to allow these very small social networks, which wasn't that long ago, to be able to grow and be able to become large social networks and give the freedom of not holding them accountable for what I might type on there. But we now see that these social platforms, in the relative scarcity of legislation around what can be said and can have to come up with their own policies, right? And so whether you agree with the policies or not, each platform can be no moderation, heavy moderation, or something in between because they're not media. The government can't enact, a, you know, well, actually, the government can't enact it on media, but Section 230 protects them and they're privately owned anyway, right? 
I will point out that most platforms have figured out they do need to moderate. In the past couple of years, we have had a couple of platforms like Truth Social, Parler, and Gab who want it to be the free speech version of Twitter, and all of them now have moderation laws, not laws, policies. Yeah, market forces are incredibly strong. I mean, but that's the point, right? It's market forces that cause them to change moderation policies, not legal frameworks. I will say, you know, uh, the especially the bigger these platforms get, they are facing not just the complicated domestic situation of navigating these policies. They have to think about compliance in India. They have to think about compliance in the EU. And these um, regimes look incredibly different. And and what, uh, you know, so some of the behaviors that we might see uh, on US platforms might actually be a result of requests that, you know, um, regulators in the EU have made or India. And so all of that's completely opaque to the user, of course, which is another problem. I think the good example of that, right, is the latest big platform to launch as threads and it's not available in the eu yet because it doesn't meet some of their regulations right um i believe that's so i i, I don't want to spread misinformation so i'll i'll right so we've talked a bit about uh there's always been misinformation disinformation and malinformation we've talked about what the differences in those are we've even talked about smartphones and especially social network platforms and I really prefer to call them social network platforms since that was the original purpose. I don't really think much of any of the media that I see on there other than the fun pic family pictures and such. But these platforms have enabled the, the spread of good information, of connections between people, but also mis, dis, and malinformation. What about generative AI and its role in creating misinformation? Are you in disinformation and malinformation? Are the three of you experts and practitioners in this field, seeing these Gen AI tools, which have really only been around for, what is it, I guess, six and a half months since ChatGPT launched, are you seeing a major uptick in the generation of mis, dis, and malinformation? I'll take a swing. Uh, I mean, large language models certainly have been around since before that, but it would be um, but it does change a lot at the end of 22. So I take the point that it is new. It's something foundationally different. We do know that uh, the capability to generate at massive quantity with trivial ease and very low cost um, is flooding the zone, uh, which is something that maybe Numa will speak to um, in, in detail because we had a, a conversation earlier about it. Um, so we do know that there is an increase in propagation of information that is generated uh, by uh, large language models and um, th that it has the capacity to not only increase at volume um, and, and therefore speed, but also in quality, where quality here I'm defining as persuasiveness, where it can be customized to target audiences. So, you know, if you say, you know, write me um, a poem in the style of Walt Whitman. Uh, that is a style flavor, and you can do the same thing and say, write me something in the style of QAnon. Th therefore, you're finding a way to customize the persuasiveness of your message at speed and scale. Um, so we do know that that's out there and happening, and I don't know that we yet have much of a response. Um. Yes. <laughs> to answer your question. Um, so we've we've obviously seen dismiss malinformation over the years, and I don't think that generative AI does anything that is drastically different. I think what it does is is that it might it increases the scale, it makes it a lot cheaper. Um, it might create more persuasive content that would have taken a lot longer to do. It might create more targeted content. Um, I think that bad actors who wanted to do that before were already doing it, but I think we might just see it at a scale that hadn't that we haven't really seen before. Um, and I think the biggest risk that comes with this is um, it's it's this idea of liar's dividend. So that's the idea is that um, you when the general public starts to realize that you can generate content that is so effective and it's so hard to distinguish from you know human or real content um they try they become really skeptical in 
real documented evidence or content that is actually true, right? And that I think is a really, really scary world to live in. Um, what is even scarier is that you could now exploit that skepticism to your advantage. So I think that's the world I'm afraid of. Yeah, I hesitate to, I mean, this space is moving so incredibly quickly. And there are big questions about um, the economics of these models and about their trajectory um, that are, aren't clear. But I, I will say, um, I think it's really fascinating how we as a society, every couple of decades, develop technologies that really force us to grapple with who we are and how we will show up as a generation. And I do think that generative AI, and more specifically, how it will affect the um, uh, communities and cultures we've built online, is one of those technologies. Um, because to me, it will fundamentally alter the economics of producing content online. Um, and you know, the marginal cost of producing anything that looks like anything uh, to any level of fidelity is dropping dramatically. Uh, and I think it even implicates questions about like, what are we owed in terms of, you know, our personal rights? What type of world do we want to live in? What, what, um, what do we deserve to know? What capabilities do we deserve to exercise in terms of being able to find out the truth for ourselves? I mean, I, I hope that it's not that it's not that dire, but um, I have read, you know, lots of analysis that point that the trajectory of these technologies is moving that direction. And a quick plug for um, the Global Disinformation Lab, we have a blog post up right now that has a re uh, reading list on generative AI um, and disinformation and misinformation, where we've curated some um, of the leading, especially academic and policy sources that have uh, worked on this uh, topic. I looked at that list and it's excellent. Please check it out. And we will have a resources slide at the end of this conversation. And I'm sorry, we did not actually make a slide of that. We'll circulate it in the Slack channel. So we will circulate a list of resources uh, in the Slack channel. So you'll be able to see that. It'll be in the misinformation channel tomorrow. We'll also circulate some recommendations from our panel here that they have collected. And hopefully I can enlist them to help answer some of the questions over the next few days that we don't get to tonight. So if you're submitting questions, trying to win that South by badge or just trying to get answers, we won't get to all of them tonight. We'll get to some during the Q&A session. You'll be able to ask the speakers afterwards as well if we didn't get to yours. And then we'll be able to answer some as the week goes on in that channel as well. I also want to take a little quick aside to, and just in case you didn't notice the credentials of these folks, we've got experts in AI and in misinformation, disinformation, information disorder, et cetera, up here. And all of them are doing really interesting things. Ryan just mentioned the paper out of his lab. Robert and I just did a podcast on this topic from a different angle. So I still encourage you to check that out a few months ago. And Numa just let me know tonight that she's got a book on generative AI coming out in October. So we're going to try to get her to come back for it. It's design. really good. Yeah, I'm I'm super excited about this. I can't believe I didn't know it. I can't believe you didn't tell me this before tonight, but I'm excited about it. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about misinformation first in the context of LLMs. Very innocently, we're already seeing that, right? We see so-called hallucinations. We see things that are less than hallucinations, but you ask it to write you an essay about something. And it gets a few facts wrong. And this is clearly not disinformation or misinformation. It's just the nature of the way these large language models are trained on a wealth of data, not all of which is accurate. And then the pathways, it works its way through choosing the next word, the next token, and what that happens to the next one after that and so on. So we've, I assume all of you have seen many examples of completely accidental misinformation in content generated by LLMs, right? Daily. All the time. And we see it in images generated too. I mean, there's the, the famous six-fingered problem when you ask it to ge generate people. And the again, these generative models don't know the rule of five fingers. They just are analyzing lots of data. And turns out most people have five or if the hand is in a ball and a fist, you know, not so many show, but every so often they get something wrong in this as well. So there's a inherent baseline of misinformation possible in any of these generative AI tools, not willful, 
not intentional, but just the nature of the tools, right? What can we do to improve that? Um, I think that is a really, really, really hard problem. Um, part of it, well, a lot of it is because of how these tools, how these models are built, right? So the way it works is you're predicting the next probable word and it is trained on thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of um, articles. Where or resources. millions or, yeah. So, right, probably, right, or trillions at this point. Um, and, and I do want to point out that part of it is also the data that it has been trained on. So when you are going and training um, data that has been on, let's say, like Reddit, and you are, you know, doing an open web crawl, you're going to Wikipedia sources. Um, but if you are actually training some of the data that has learned a lot of um, the biases of our world, um, maybe it has also seen a lot of these conspiracy theories if you are training a lot of these Reddit threads. Um, that is also something I think that we need to be a little bit mindful of when we look at these LLMs. Um, but outside of that, I think it's also just the probabilistic nature of how they work. And um, that is, I think, a really, really hard problem to solve, right? You can do a couple things to make them a little bit safer. So you could do some like post-processing techniques on top of it. So you could maybe build a classifier. You could have a classifier that's like, this is hateful content. This is not hateful content and have that do um, and you classify the output before you generate it. You could do something um, like I know that there's been a lot of um, hype about reinforcement learning from human feedback where the humans are going through a lot of these answers and picking what the right one is or what they think the right one is. Um, there, I do want to point out that you have limitations on just the quality and quantity of people. So this would also be on the abilities of the people, and then also that this is really, really hard to do. Um, you have people looking at terrible content all day when you think about you know, mental health issues for things like that. Um, you can also do things like content filtering. You could do it on either side. You could do it before the model is trained. You could do it after it's trained. Um, you can also do something that's called um, constitutional AI, which is basically reinforcement learning from AI feedback. So you train an adversarial model, um, which would kind of work against the model that you have to do something similar that you were doing for reinforcement learning from human feedback, except this would even an AI to do it. So that way you could scale it a little bit more. Um, and you don't have humans looking at terrible content. So there are there are ways to make models safer. I will say that this is a very hard problem. Um, and even the best of the best hallucinate. So before we move into using these tools intentionally for disinformation, I think I want to summarize what you said there. And I, I think there are really three things that, that I got out of that. Um, one is that if there's errors in the data, you scrape the entire web, then there's always a chance of an LLM producing some errors in the output. So maybe the thing to do there is in future LLMs that are trained for special purposes, you can control the quality of the data. And so that might be one way to do it. Ideally, you want to document your entire data set. That's right. Which is very hard, I know. But that's- All the major companies do that though, right? And they release the full list of all the data, yes, right? Yes, yes, they do. I mean, you could imagine a company like anything. picking randomly John Deere, putting all of their technical information, user guides, et cetera, and training a model about using their tractors where there is no false information in that special purpose LLM. So if you control the data quality and ensure it's accurate, that's that's one way to improve quality. Probably the best way to improve it. <laughs> the second you mentioned is the feedback mechanism of updating the information. If it generates wrong information because it's been trained on a massive amount of data, there are things like human feedback and you mentioned AI generated feedback as well to continuously improve the likelihood of accurate information, correct? And the third method you mentioned was adding some post-processing capability. And this makes a lot of sense with these code generators where you can ask it to write a song and 
who's to say whether the song is right or wrong? But if you ask it to generate code, the code is right or wrong. It, mathematical equations as well. We've seen them generate correct mathematical answers, but no one would use an LLM in place of a calculator for a, a, an answer they really, a mathematical computation they depend on. So these are areas where post-processing could be added to it, right? To do fact checking, guardrail checking, or even syntax checking for code or uh, things like that, right? Yeah, you could certainly do all of those things. Great. Now let's, oh, sorry. Oh, Ryan, go I'm ahead. just going to add, you know, another modality I think that is worth considering is kind of retrieval ge augmented generation where the LLM is used um, as kind of a, an age is given an agency to use tools, right? So in the example that you uh, just gave of, you wouldn't trust it to do your calculation for you. Um, well, you may not trust the, the large language model to do that. But you might trust that the large language model could uh, model the problem that you have and call an API, such as like Wolfram Alpha, um, or in the case of you know what what Bing and Google are up to, uh, they in order to minimize hallucination, we will go to the actual source material, right, and 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 summarize that, which of course just introduces a, a whole new vector of threat, right? Because if there is, um, it has been shown that you can kind of hijack the prompt. Um, that these large language models are using when they're searching the web if you embed um, certain content on your website, right? So these systems are both the generator and now the target of misinformation, which is very interesting. I like that you brought up that point about Wolfram Alpha. Have you read the book, What is Chat GPT and What Is It Doing? There's a book that you can get for $7.95 and I get none of it, so no stake in this. But to me, it was the cheapest good book on generative AI until Numa's book comes out. Uh, in October, and it explains what it's doing, so you get a feel for why it is so powerful, but why it's also got some built-in potential for inaccuracies. And of course, Wolfram wrote it, so he has a section at the end about how you can fix the inaccuracies by callouts to things such as Wolfram Alpha, and he gives several code examples of doing that. And this, it's actually a special case example of what you brought up: post-processing of this to make sure that the factual parts are actually derived from factual information. And the prose that's meant to sound like humans still benefits from the LLM. I really like that model. Now we're going to talk about disinformation. And there's going to be a little bit of a homework assignment. We're actually going to, going to give away two badges tonight. John, can you make that? There we go. So we have one badge giveaway for the best question of the night as selected by our moderator. But we're going to make this a two badge thing to reward you from bravey, for braving the heat. And this is a contest where you're going to generate some disinformation. Now we have some rules. Don't generate anything mean. Don't generate anything partisan. Don't generate anything hateful. We're a kind, curious, smart group. I'll give you an example of what I mean on the next slide. But this slide has the rules and the objective. And all we want to do is get across the point to our in-person attendees and our online attendees that these tools can very easily and quickly create disinformation, just like smartphones and social media platforms enable you to very quickly scale out and spread that disinformation. So never before has there been a time where you could so rapidly create compelling disinformation is this, and you probably won't be able to read this and it's not even all on here, but just to prove I could do this since I'm asking you to do it. Oh my God, congratulations. I, in, in fact- Where's your tiara? Thank you. So I am Miss uh, Universe 2023 now, and it you can see my prompt is very simple. I didn't give it any guidance on how to justify me winning Miss Universe. It made it all up and it's not all on here, but it even quotes the head of the Miss Universe pageant congratulating me. It made up a quote from an actual person doing this. It realized hmm, Jay is male, so we're gonna have to make up some stuff about being the, uh, you know, the competition being more wide open and more for all genders and and such. And so it was so good at the end of it, I thought I had one Miss uh, Universe 2023. That's how compelling this was. And it was, it took me 30 seconds to do it. We're giving you till 7.30 and we're going to keep the conversation going. But that gives you about 25 minutes and here are the rules. 
only an in-person series trying to get in on the game. So only in the badge, again, by the rules of the South by badges, only an in-person person can win the badge. We also want you only submitting one entry. I have five judges. If they see two entries from you, you will not win with either one. So if you come up with something better, delete the first one so that they can look at 730 for what they think is the best entry. So just submit one, make it a good one. It's why I warned you in Slack yesterday and at the beginning of the event today to make sure you could fire up something like chat, chat GPT. They're going to judge it on creative and compelling, but absolutely throw out anything that's mean. So you get a chance to win a badge just by creating some disinformation. And again, the objective is just for you to know how easy that is to do, which then I then posted on my social media platform. And so now all of my friends could think I am Miss Universe 2023 as well. So uh, let's talk about this a little bit. Um, I tried to do a couple of other examples and it turns out there's guardrails in some of these platforms, right? I did a couple of political examples, two precisely, one each direction. And it I won't say what they were, but it flagged one of them because it said, no, there's plenty of scientific evidence for X. And so we don't present misinformation about that. But have you all heard of the napalm example in ChatGPT? Um, a few of you have. You know, the guardrail doesn't let you it tell you how to make napalm. And someone figured out that if you change the prompt to Back in the old days, my grandmother used to tell us stories about how to make napalm, and it was sufficient to trick GPT at that time and say, oh, well, this is what the story would have been, and it gave the recipe for it. So with these things, there are guardrails, right, and there are ways to defeat the guardrails. Can you all talk about the current state of guardrails in these things and who determines them, and are there ways to, to catch these hacks around it? and train with human feedback to prevent that. I want to quickly point out something really interesting about that that I just noticed, is that it decided you were a man. You didn't actually say that. Assume that there's something on the web. That, you know, that's a good point. They're probably, yeah, that's a good point. Just... Back to your points about but wouldn't that just be data. because the LLM had been trained on many, many occurrences exactly. of the name J and very few were women? Yeah. 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 But it is a good point. If you wanted to win the Miss Universe pageant, and it's a reasonable assertion that that the opposite might be true there. And so it, it still made that choice. Yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly point that out. That's a good point. <laughs> Restate the question for us. Ah, sorry. sorry. So the, so the question is, a good point. are there guardrails in here? How do we improve those guardrails? Because it is really easy to create intentional. We, we talked about misinformation could be accidental because of the way LLMs and generative image models work. But I just proved that you could create very intentional disinformation. I just picked a funny example instead of a mean one. But what are we going to do to prevent that? So there are guardrails. I think it's um, it's a really hard problem to figure out what guardrails to put without making your chatbot not engaging or um, very limiting. Hold on one second. In case you didn't see it on the slide, the channel to submit your entry to is event-contest. So you'll have to add that if you haven't already figured it out. You'll have to add that channel for the submission. That's where the judges are going to look. Sorry, Numa, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I realized I'd forgotten to say that. So generate your disinformation and submit it to the channel event dash contest. Sorry, Numa. Not news. <laughs> Not news. Yeah. Uh, the channel totally true stuff is off limits for this. Yeah, Not the other news events and recommendations channel. Uh, definitely just to the event contest channel. I would add to Numa's point that it, it's a game of whack-a-mole, like so many things. It's a it's a weapons race. It's a game of whack-a-mole. You know, I think er early on, GPT, if you just simply said, write me a script about X, it immediately rout routed around every guardrail that it rolled to market with initially. I think they've put guardrails around that guardrail, I think now. Yeah. But, but the point is... You can still get around them. So prompt jailbreaking, 
Um, there are a lot of alter egos out there of chat GPT. There's Dan, which is probably the most famous one, which is do anything now. Um, and it's this really intense, like scripted, it's like maybe three or four paragraphs at this point, I think the latest version that I saw, which has given it, which has given this alter ego to chat GPT and it tells it to not, you know, follow any of the guardrails. Um, and there's, there's a couple like that. So there's, there's several of those. And as a lot of these big um, LLM platforms are finding these alter egos or prompts that people are using to jailbreak them, um, they are putting guardrails like, around them, but it's really just a cat and mouse game, right? Like they will find it and then people will innovate and then they're going to have to come back and do this. They're just gonna go in a circle. Um, yeah, anything else with computers and people trying to break the rules like hacking, exactly. right? Like hackers find a new way, the security professionals find a way to prevent that and, and so yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important to note that there's not a good way to forecast what other personas lie beneath the surface of chat GPT and, and to a lesser extent GPT-4's very friendly, helpful persona. Um, that was specifically designed through, you know, as as was discussed previously, this um, human enhanced uh, reinforcement learning. So, you know, you have humans who are grading the responses of um, outputs to try to shape it into this mask. But underneath that mask is the whole internet. Underneath that mask is the whole internet. And I think that um, these companies will face a difficult time trying to create a mask comprehensive enough that nothing else slips out that's undesir undesirable. And I, I have to say, on, on a more personally alarming note, I'm very concerned with how much focus is is going into the, you know these small number of companies: OpenAI, Microsoft, um, uh, Anthropic. Um, when there is a really uh, quickly evolving and vibrant open source community uh, that is building off of the Stanford Llama um, uh, model weights. And a llama. Stanford. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's, thank you. Yeah. Alpaca, llama, we need some different it's names. It's confusing. Um, it is cute though. Uh, but, you know, we were talking earlier about how it's easier to imagine LLMs doing misinformation. And well, of course, no one's going to use uh, these technologies for disinformation. Well, if you can fine tune a, a model on uh, 4chan, which someone has done, um, you'll be able to very effectively produce 4chan content. I mean, we don't know how capable the base foundation models that the open source community can produce will eventually be. And once you have these base foundation models with a certain level of capability, it's pretty trivial to fine tune them into all sorts of undesirable behavior. I think that's a really good point. And people are training um, the llama models for a couple hundred dollars. No matter what great guardrails we put in place, there will be a number of polities that will put zero guardrails in place. And we just have to remember that that's part of the ecosystem. That's not to say we shouldn't put the guardrails in place and improve them and whack the moles as we find them. Absolutely, we should. But we must be um, clear eyed about the fact that there will be many models that get exfiltrated, they get, they get gated, they will get trained uh, with different personalities on the worst things imaginable. That is certainly our future. Yeah, and I guess what I'm most concerned about is it, it is kind of a whack-a-mole, just like the cybersecurity game. It, but the challenge here seems to be the speed at which people can generate so many different false articles and images, we're gonna to get to deep fakes in a moment, but so many false articles and false things, there's no way to have human checking keep up with that, right? So we're gonna to have to use, I assume, AI as a tool to identifying uh, possible disinformation and malinformation, if not misinformation, right? Yes and no. Um, I think any technical solution would be a partial solution, not a complete solution. I think that this was already a really, really hard problem. I think the problem has gotten even harder. And I don't think that there is a sil silver bullet solution with technology. I think that you can probably um, use it um, in combination with other techniques. And that's probably a really good way to use it. And I do think you you should use it that way. Like you should 
you should have AI tools to do a lot of these detections. But you cannot only rely on those AI tools because there is nothing, I don't think we're ever going to be able to live in a world where you have some sort of mythical tool that detects every piece of um, generated content every single time. Like, unfortunately, I just don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, these are socio-technical systems, right? The problem is not matrix multiplication. The problem is not vector databases. The problem is we have different values in society and the values are contested. And we have different information sharing behaviors and some of them are really harmful to people and others um, are benign. The problem is us in combination with our tools. It's not matrix multiplication. So it's going to be a socio-technical solution to a socio-technical problem. This underlines the landscape of, of adversarial AI as it relates to this, right? And something that, that you said earlier in answer to a question is that it, it's about the whole chain of data, one, and two, that, that these models are both producers and consumers. So to the point that you were making about, you know, massive propagation of websites, if these models are trained against the most available content uh, there is, and the most numerous data there is, then it will be trained on the internet, the internet which now is uh, significantly or at least non-trivially constitutive of content produced by the models. And so it, it will eat its own tail like an Ouroboros, and there will be adversarial actors whose function is not to produce believable narratives, but rather to produce content that will adversarially train the model downstream so that it's producing content that's more problematic. And you have to look at it from that entire context. Bingo, that was a great point. You, I was going to get to that in the next question, but the danger isn't just in someone being able to generate more false information that they use social media platforms to spread, but to post it and make it false information fuel for the next LLM that scrapes the whole internet. And so now you've got more disinformation in the training body if you're not careful, right? I strong agree. And I'd expand it to be even information that isn't false. There, there's plenty of true information that can be propagated that is being done by people with particular motives um, that are harmful. And like hate speech. Yeah, it, at least it, at least it, it evades truth falsity evaluations. Um, but but maybe you know uh, it, going into a prompt uh, and saying, you know, what give me one hundred examples of content that would dissuade any particular group from going to the ballot box. Well, that's that. The, the, some of it's going to be true. Some of it's going to be information that is valid and, and authentic and accurate. And also it's not being done with the best interest at heart of that group. Or it's true information that is perhaps propagated um, in such that it doesn't reflect the true distribution in reality, right? It, it creates a mirror world that the uh, large language model is trained on where its perspective on our world is very different than the one we live in. Um, and also, this is something that can be very easily manipulated. I think there was a recent paper, security researchers spent $60 to effectively poison um, the data that one of these large language models was trained on. Uh, it was mostly um, uh, through free Wikipedia edits and a combination of like Flickr uploads. It was pretty trivial. Yeah, this is concerning <laughs> on so many ways. Um, our ability to now generate lots of false information or information with an intent to persuade whether it's true or false, and then spread that information very quickly and so on and so on and so on, seems like it's going to be a very challenging thing for us to keep up with. I mean, it's always challenging to root out the lies and something, but this is, seems like it's going to be an extraordinary challenge now to detect and counter in some way disinformation and malinformation, right? Sorry, that was a depressing question. Let me rephrase that question. Are you optimistic about our ability to use these tools in time since these LLMs have only been out for in the public for six months? Are you optimistic that the research community working with industry will be able to generate tools that it's still going to be whack-a-mole, but that can largely keep this problem at bay or at least react very quickly 
before there's just a persistent amount of untrustable information on the net. I'm at heart a powerfully optimistic person. For me, it's a resounding yes, but I also think there will be a dip before it's possible. I think even calling uh, anyone an expert in generative AI, in particular, we three, I, I don't mean to speak on behalf of you all, but it makes me squidgy because it's too new and too emergent for anyone to be experts. Um, and also, um, I believe that it's a, um, a socio-technological problem uh, and and that the the long arc of the moral universe bends towards justice and rightness. But that's my own calibration as a human. I don't think that we can ever put an end to disinformation. Um, but like we've mentioned, I think this is a socio-technical problem. And I think that it requires a whole of society solution. So I think what we need is we need regulators, we need government, we need lawyers, we need civil society, we need researchers, we need industry, we need everyone to come together to find a way to put appropriate mitigations in place. Because a lot of the ways to solve this would be some form of unilateral solution which I don't think we're going to, I don't think we're going to be able to solve it with just, um, I don't know, really good post-processing techniques. I don't think we're going to be able to solve it with researchers um, who don't really have the compute resources or, um, you know, ability to scrape as much data as the industry does and are limited to come with some, you know, really great technical solutions. And, to be fair, I do think people are going to come up with really incredible solutions. And I think that those solutions need to be used in parallel with um, regulators and platforms and society. I am hopeful. I have hope, uh, which maybe eludes the, again, the binary of optimism, <laughs> pessimism, because I think, um, it will require things that we're not currently doing. It will require a level of sophistication in terms of the conversations we're having, and they have to be good faith conversations. Bad faith conversations um, will not help us solve this problem. And I agree, it's gotta be a socio-technical and, and cultural. I can see a cultural movement building around this where we ask ourselves the question, you know, if we extrapolate this, this technological curve, what world do we wanna leave our children? A, a world where they don't really have the right to exercise their judgment in the same way that we did. Um, and there is a body of, of literature around epistemic rights that is emerging, the, you know, the rights to know and to be known and, and govern those um, that I think is very interesting. And I think a, a cultural movement, I think regulation has its place. Um, and I think it's just kind of incumbent on all of us to follow a very quickly moving complex issue area, but it's kind of the, the only choice we have. In terms of policy, I think there are a couple low hanging fruit um, that we should reach for, which is leaning on things like the uh, Federal Trade Commission deceptive practices to at minimum insist that we have the right to know when we are engaging with a uh, an agent that is a large language model or whatever, you know, seven months from now, whatever architecture we're on. Because that's another thing. We've just assumed that this uh, continuation of large language models is where we'll be, but we don't know. Um, so I think that at minimum is something that we should focus on and an antitrust regime that uh, at least doesn't um, promote uh, the outcome where three companies are really deciding all of these issues. Um, we are almost done with our conversation, and I want to make sure we respect the attendees in person and online that have submitted questions. So I'm going to ask you two lightning questions now as opposed to the long form. One, which are you more worried about, uh, disinformation and malinformation generated in text by large language models or generated in AI uh, imagery and video, i.e. deepfakes? Which worries you more about persuading people and our ability to account for it? Imagery and video. Being is believing, imagery and video. Imagery and video with the caveat that I think a lot of folks haven't thought about, uh, you know, CSVs and Excel files are made out of text. Um, and there are some really interesting electoral uh, <laughs> nightmares yeah. that could pop out of that outcome. All right, next lightning question. Uh, we used to see cybersecurity try to steal your IP. 
then in the era of large-scale data analytics and AI, they're even also trying to steal your raw data. Do we now foresee cybersecurity intrusions meant to change your data so that it will change the kind of uh, AI results you get in your company, enterprise, military, et cetera? Is that a new cybersecurity threat that they don't even steal the data, they change it? That flavor of adversarial AI is on the horizon for sure. Yes, we're already seeing data poisoning. Yes, yeah. And I'll give a little nod out to the recent AR, VR announcement from Apple and the belief, we the belief, I think most of us have that eventually AR will be significant. Do you even see the possibility of people influencing people's interpretations of what they read and see as a form of disinformation and misinformation such that we'll have to build an appropriate security and checking even into these kinds of devices? Absolutely. Yes. Not tomorrow, but yeah, eventually. Uh, final question before we bring up our moderator for the audience Q&A is, what is your top recommendation for everybody who's here, either personally or for their organization or company, to protect themselves against potentially increased amounts and effectiveness of disinformation? I can take this one. Go ahead. Wait, I'm going to ask each of you for one. Um, check your sources. Just really check your sources, um, assess the quality of the information that you are reading before you share it, and what you're sharing is actually true. Uh, if you read a headline and you think to yourself, yeah, yeah, I bet they did that. Yeah, that makes sense. If it tickles the back of your brain and where it confirms your priors, you know, your political out party did this thing that is the dumbest thing you can ever imagine. If it's hitting all those buttons, that's when you should especially engage all of your digital literacy skills. And I'm just going to go with the basics. Just lock down your passwords. Just engage in great cybersecurity hygiene. Be careful what tools you use and change your passwords and use different ones. I, it sounds lame, but actually it makes a difference in every domain. And this is just one of them. And that's actually a good accidental plug. We have a new podcast episode planned for personal cybersecurity for all of this. That's that's good advice. Um, with that, I would like to introduce a, a good friend and colleague and one of the most well-known people in Austin in the tech space, Paul O'Brien. He's the CEO and founder of Media Tech Ventures, and he is going to conduct the moderated uh, Q&A from the audience. So, Paul, can you please come to the stage? Welcome, Paul. And remember, you have two more minutes to get your contest entry in, and I'm going to go talk to the judges in the back in a bit while you conduct this Q&A. And, and how much time do we want for Q&A? About, about 10 or 15 minutes? Now, now of, course, of course, the last question that Jay asked was amongst the most popular questions from everybody. How do you, how do you possibly look for any other source of authoritative information? How do you protect yourself? So definitely jump in Slack after tonight and, and have that conversation with some folks. I found this one interesting given that, uh, and it was from Abigail uh, Aduji. Uh, it, uh, it, similar question, but a good way to guide the guardrails against different types of false and misleading information. Given that the internet is capable of new tools generating AI and using past forms of information abuse. Can you talk about different ways to guide the guard, guide rails to help provide that feedback if you're not actually in the business of training these things? What what could everybody else do to help? Are you maybe talking about on the user side? So how, you're, so. how are you prompting it maybe? Sure, let's go with that, it seems so. Okay, well, there's a couple. Um, so prompt engineering, as I think most people know, is a really new typed field. Um, and there are a couple ways to design your prompts to limit hallucinations. So you could look into things like chain of thought prompting. A lot of these try to mirror how like a human brain would work. So they help you kind of design your prompts in a way where you can um, guide your AI to get answers that likely wouldn't hallucinate. So something you could look into is called change of thought prompting. There's self-consistency prompting. There's a tree of thought prompting as well. 
um, you could also do something which is called reflective prompting. So you would just ask the AI to kind of like critique itself, reflect on its answers. Um, I think those are the big ones that come out of my head. But one thing I love about your first recommendation is that it reflects the post-processing grounding approach, uh, running it through a corpus of data that has been validated for whatever reason, and and uh, in many cases will then cite its sources. So if you can just construct your prompt to say, cite your sources um, to, to a point Numa also made earlier, th then you, you're you you're putting some guardrails by way of your prompts. And then check those citations. And then check them. Something you can, you can also do what is called a um, knowledge generation prompting where you can kind of give it context to generate the knowledge that you want. So there you could actually give it some of the citations that you wanted to talk about. Great suggestions. I, I found this one rather amusing since we're talking about the fact that misinformation is, is the problem itself. We have books getting published. We have podcasts getting published. We have blog posts about this stuff. Uh, Praveen uh, Nuthalapati, thank you for this question. What's the best way to actually educate everyone uh, about misinformation, disinformation? out there on social media, in social media, especially since most of that education is getting passed to them through social media. <laughs> um, are there examples of misinformation and disinformation that helps people understand whether or not they're becoming skeptical enough so they know whether or not to trust but verify or to look for resources? I, I like the education point first and foremost, right? Education these days is a bit of a challenge. How do you even know if the education is true? Thoughts about that? Well, I think first it's important to acknowledge that platforms have a special responsibility here um, because I, I would imagine they will represent overwhelmingly where most users will first interact with these systems. Um, and they have a responsibility not to anthropomorphize, not to simplify, um, to surface these problems. And to a large extent, we see these companies acting pretty responsible. I mean, you know, Microsoft, Google, they are very upfront about the, the status of these technologies. Um, I think that, you know, in general, we still are catching up um, in terms of digital literacy. We, there are literacies that we all need that, we, that are simply not well distributed. Um, and I think, you know, that means curriculum at every level of education. And I think uh, he, tre treating um, the process of knowledge construction and letting people see behind, you know, the academic curtain that the, the pragmatic process of how research is produced, how newsrooms work, procedural knowledge generation, um, uh, information about how newsrooms work has actually been shown to um, be a great uh, intervention um, to help people stop spreading disinformation and misinformation. So um, being more transparent, uh, you know, as much as it's a pat answer is really uh, uh, proven to be pretty effective. I think Ryan makes a really good point. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that media literacy campaigns have been very effective. Um, I would recommend checking out lateral, lateral rating and the SIFT method. Um, there have been several studies on both of those. Great suggestions. Uh, this is an interesting one from Isabella Sherwood, uh, especially given the fact that things have changed so rapidly just in the last four or five years, despite the fact that that ChatGPT has come out. Uh, why did we not as a society notice disinformation and misinformation as much before COVID-19? Did something happen? when we were shut down? What, what made everyday people realize that dis disinformation that we now see is much more prevalent? Any thoughts? It's an intriguing question because arguably some things changed, not just with the technology, but perhaps society or politics or education or being stuck at home all the time. I mean, I, I think mortality is a potent um, uh, persuasive element in human experience. So I think uh, seeing people die um, and seeing people die sometimes because they uh, believed things that were to their own harm. So I think that's something that was a change. I also think it's it, there's a little bit of a trajectory. I think that we started to understand the issue maybe as early as 2014, at least in some circles. Um, we, we get a spike in it around 2017. But some ideas take a little while to take hold. And so I, I would say that I think by 2020, society had caught up to computational propaganda as an idea. But I think mortality matters more. 
I just want to add, it's always been really apparent to the victims. It's just they haven't always been centered. I mean, uh, a lot of the techniques and, and tropes that were later adopted by even state disinformation actors come out of misogynistic online forums um, and where um, false information was generated about women at scales that you just wouldn't believe. So uh, I'm, I think that, um, and you know, before that, a lot of the political disinformation in this country was targeted at uh, marginalized groups. I mean, um, here in Austin, there I, I believe it was um, Father Coughlin. I forget his name. He, he had a he had a radio um, uh, broadcast where he spread you know vile um, uh, information about marginalized folks uh, in the 1930s to millions of people. Right. So again, it goes back to there's it, this isn't maybe um, his completely historically historically novel, but I do agree that the the pandemic is one of those things where it, you know to a certain extent we can all now, I uh, imagine ourselves victims, right? Because we're looking around us and we're being like, well, why, why don't you have a mask on or, or are you vaccinated or something? So it just makes it easier to appreciate all of these dynamics that are already happening. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that's an excellent point. Um, so I've been working on this since about 2016 or so. And a lot of disinformation that I was working with was largely political disinformation. I think once you kind of get around to 2020 and you see the pandemic and there are more people who are now... Um, maybe being affected by a lot of these conspiracy theories and propaganda. So they're more aware of these problems. Great questions and great answers. And they're still coming in. Actually, June Kumagai has a great question that uh, kind of gets to the heart. And I, and I saw a similar question uh, at the beginning of the conversation tonight about defining truth, which is a, an exceptionally hard question to answer. Uh, so I like June's better. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer you that one. Uh, we're talking about uh, dis and mis and mal information, but not information itself. So can you can you just better characterize how we define information and and what that's considered is a is a weather forecast, which is a prediction. Well, that's that's information, but possibly also misinformation because it might not be true. What what what's the position or or theory that applies to the just the idea of information and and how it drives what we're doing here? I mean, I'd say that any sensory input into our cognition of any kind whatsoever constitutes information. Whenever encoder and decoder agree on the meaning of, I mean, we could go back to Shannon and, and, and you know, the measurement of entropy. I mean, I think that there are useful analogies to disinformation and misinformation at almost every level um, of the information hierarchy, right? Like it, it's a productive idea even though, as we've all acknowledged, it's a very difficult one to define and, you know, truth even more so, right? You know, so of course the question of truth has to lend itself to the question of policy these days. And so Aurora Quinn Elmore asked her a great question that, that struck me in fact, because uh, Sun News in Australia just, just last, last week or something uh, made the point that our policymakers are ill-informed. So how can they conceivably uh, address any regulation about this. And so she does ask, how do, how do policymakers actually shape uh, the incentive landscape for social media uh, and traditional media to effectively counter mis- and disinformation? What, what, what can we do to help them do so if, if, if we should? How can we help regulators shape the incentives for? for... How, how can policymakers shape the incentive landscape for social media and traditional media? to effectively counter disinformation and misinformation. My read of it would be, how do we help government policy create incentives to prevent misinformation and disinformation, if I'm reading that accurately? I mean, the, the, the right size regulatory regime uh, for, for this, for this issue, for this area, um, uh, requires a whole of society response. Uh, and uh, we, we cer certainly should have um, the founder of OpenAI in to uh, consult, um, but we should not rely exclusively on them. Uh, I'm, I'm not, um, uh, th th there will always be uh, a profit motive some places, and um, that doesn't mean they're not uh, expert 
um, but also we need to ensure that researchers are part of the equation. We need to uh, ensure that just citizens who are consumers of information are part of the equation. So it needs to be a diverse set of stakeholders. It should include industry. It should include researchers. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not thinking of other key stakeholder groups, but but it should be a panoply of consultative um, advisors into uh, into that that context. And I think uh, I absolutely agree. And I think one um, aspect that isn't a lot, thought of a lot is just making um, guidance clearer, you know, at, at the federal agency level. And a lot of these things are are still very murky. And um, you know, it often changes from administration to administration. But um, in terms of things like antitrust, in terms of things like privacy, privacy has a huge um, a nexus with disinformation and misinformation. Um, but also, I think there are opportunities. We're facing a radically uh, challenging problem. There are radical solutions that you know are outside the box that are worth considering. You know, I, there's been amazing research on things like citizens' assemblies, where they use technologies like large language models to help facilitate um, representative conversations from the communities actually affected by these technologies to help generate guidelines to help generate um, intended outcomes. And, you know, if one of the problems is that um, our representative official represented uh, elected officials aren't um, uh, informed well enough, uh, I agree, we, it, the companies play a role in educating them, but also citizens can play a role in educating them. And I think that's partially incumbent on us. Fantastic. Thank you. I've been given the finger by Jay and the finger means one more question or or the award winning question the award winning question all right we got one more everybody and and actually i think i think we built very nicely to this one so i'm i'm pleased it's the last one because it's perhaps the most difficult to answer but at, at the same time perhaps the most important also uh, yeah, well yes is the person in the room uh praveen, praveen are you here praveen. ah wonderful very nice to meet you praveen a good set of questions throughout Slack. So we'll see it South by Southwest as well. All right. Talk about the awareness of misinformation and dis disinformation info internationally. Uh, and what are countries and regions doing to recognize the system of systemic effects that need to be in place to combat things, given the fact that this is a global phenomenon, not, not just US policy that matters. I think you're probably our expert. I mean, please, please uh, log on to gdeal.org, Global Disinformation Lab. We have forthcoming our Global Disinformation Policy Database, which will hopefully directly address some of these questions. But in general, we see um, governments around the world, A, defining these concepts very differently. Russia has disinformation laws. They have disinformation policy. China has disinformation laws and policy, right? But they are not what we would imagine what not what we would imagine for ourselves or want for ourselves right so the the diversity of opinion um uh, countries like india pursuing very uh, aggressive uh, measures of um holding platform workers liable personally uh governments are setting up uh, work uh, um task forces they're they're setting up teams inside inside agencies they're creating sweeping regulatory regimes around um, specific types of information like election disinformation, misinformation in the case of Ireland, um, uh, notably recently. So the, the diversity of things that are being tried is actually really cool because we're all going to see collectively what works and what doesn't. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's difficult to characterize because people are trying a lot of different things. Great thoughts, Ted. Thoughts, Ted. Thank you three very, very much. Round of applause, maybe one more time. I appreciate you. Jay, 